Hey guys, welcome to the Breakout Podcast. Today I have Walter Gordon from California with us. Hello, good to be here. Thank you so much for being here today. Could you just start and give us a little bit of background of how you got to where you are today? Yeah, sure, man. I appreciate you having me on. And um, I actually uh, started my career, um, you know, years ago. I'm actually from the Bay Area, from from Berkeley. I bounced around quite a bit in my in my youth, but I ended up uh, arriving at Berkeley. I spent 12 years there, and so I ended up going to high school there, going to college, studied business, uh, started my career in banking, and spent about uh, five years in banking, three different banks, and so. Um, was looking to make a change. wasn't sure what I really wanted to do at that point. It just was, I kind of could see the writing in the wall in my banking career and saw that there was a, just a lot of mergers, consolidations happening. It felt like that was going to be continuing um, to happen. And so I was looking to make a change. I was looking, um, I wasn't exactly sure what I wanted to do, but uh, the company I work with today, uh, actually, I was approached by a gentleman who actually had just moved from the East Coast to the East Bay. And he was looking to expand his business. And he said, hey, we don't want you to come work with me part-time. Uh, get your licensing in place. And so that's what I did. And um, once I got established, you know, working part-time with him, um, I really was excited about uh, making a full wholesale career change. And that's, that's what I did. And once I did, you know, there were some bumps along the way, but I, I really never looked back. That's amazing. Can you give us some key factors on what people should consider when determining their investment goals? So as an investment advisor, one of the things I really um, encourage people to do is to you know, start with a plan. Uh, most people don't plan to fail. They, they certainly fail to plan. And so they'll have that written program in place. So it's really important to, yeah, have a plan in place, set goals, certainly um, take into account the n- numerous variables that can affect an investment program. Um, over the long term and then but once you have it set up it's just it should it should work on autopilot and just make the most you know minor adjustments kind of what i call tighten the screws along the way amazing so how can investors navigate validity and an economic uncertainty so volatility is a big thing and um one of the things i learned early on uh is and this is really before now you can pull out your phone and trade you know all kinds of different you know securities investments um at the, yeah, it's at the tip of your fingers where before you really had to go through a broker and eventually you know once uh internet came into uh you know popularity that's when you know online brokers became more 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 prominent and so i think it's really important to make sure you're managing uh volatility and um, i'm a big believer in mutual funds just because it's the it's the safest way to invest in the stock market now there's it's good to be diversified outside of that as well if you um if you'd like to i think that's the good really the mainstay of most of my investors, most of my clients' portfolios, including my own. Amazing. So what gave you the inspiration behind primarily helping out younger individuals? So I geared my business to a younger demographic uh, a few years ago, and it was for a couple of reasons. One is that when I was coming up in my career, I was the first in my family to get a college degree, so I'm super proud of that. Uh, but it also presented me with some challenges when it came to navigating my career. I was, I was looking for guidance, looking for mentorship. And had trouble finding it. And so I, I made a promise to myself years ago that once I got established in my career, I would be willing to um, kind of pay it forward, right? And that's what I'm doing. Um, the other thing that kind of brought that to light was um, my daughter, who is a, uh, just wrapping up her college career at uh, San Diego State University. Uh, you know, she um, decided to study business. And that was kind of a reminder to me, like, oh, okay, well, here's your opportunity to start kind of not only helping her, you know, navigate her career, but also be able to expand that to other students and recent graduates. And that's what I've been doing for the last several years. And it's, uh, it's been really, really fun and great, you know, being, uh, you know, really stepping into a coaching mentoring role. And I find that that's what I really enjoy doing the most. Yeah, I'm sure it always feels good to be helping out others. Definitely. So what are the pros and cons of different investment vehicles, like stocks, bonds, real estate? Yeah, I mean, there's a whole, uh, I, I tell people all the time that, uh, especially young people coming into this industry, that the industry has become more complicated, I would say, over the last 10 or 15 years, meaning that there's more investment uh, vehicles, there's more different ways to invest, uh, different you know, product features, a lot, of be- more, a lot more bells and whistles than you had, you know, when I started, you know, 30 some years ago. And so I, I think it's, important to understand that, you know, when you look at, you know, 
stocks. I mean, mainly it's putting all your eggs in one basket, you know, not, you know, there's a lot of volatility when you choose two or three or four or five or 10 stocks, you really can't get adequate diversification. So that's, that's the main thing with stocks. That's why mutual funds, again, as I said, it's a, it's a safer way to invest in the market. When it comes to things like, uh, and I was, you know, if you look at, you know, cryptocurrency, which is a big, has been a big over the last few years, that's volatility to a whole nother different level, right? Mm -hmm. And so uh, for average individual investors, while you can certainly um, dabble in stocks and in cryptocurrency and things like that, it's really important to, again, as your mainstay, when it comes to your long-term investment portfolio for things like retirement, planning for your kid's college, um, you know, looking to buy a home, you know, um, which might be a short-term goal, but certainly something you want to, you know, be have uh, take a lot of risk. Uh, I think it's important to understand the basic tenets of different investment vehicles, and then choose a mainstay, and then of course you can diversify outside of that uh, as it as it's appropriate. Okay, that makes sense. Yeah, cryptocurrency is very very wacky right now. It's, <laughs> it's, it's, I mean, it's exciting when you you know when, when you it's it's fun to ride the wave. There's a reason why people ride roller coasters, right? It's fun. Mm -hmm. It's scary at the same time, right? It is scary. I think that's what kind of adds to it is like you could get a high yield savings account and like watch it grow kind of slowly, like expected of what the numbers are going to be. Or you could put it, some of it into crypto and <laughs> then it'll like shoot up 100% and then like drop down 50 the next day. So, yeah. which, which really is the, the, the real challenge when it comes to, you know, uh, whether you're investing in digital stocks or crypto or anything that has a lot of uh, potential for ups and downs is that it's the hardest thing about it is to separate the emotion from your investment strategy, right? Mm -hmm. Because everybody knows if you, you know, to buy low and sell high, right? But it's just, it's hard emotionally to get off that roller coaster when you really should. And that's the hardest thing, even for someone that's experienced in the industry to be able to uh, stick to that, to what makes sense, which is, you know, not timing the market, but timed in the market. Mm -hmm. So how do you deal with that? Like, do you have any strategies yourself that help you stay grounded? Yeah, great question. I, um, <laughs> for me, I think it's important to, to not listen to all the noise, right? So I, I think if you're on, I mean, it's great to get onto podcasts and get onto webinars and, and I'm on quite a few of those as an advisor. And, you know, and I, I recommend clients kind of stay informed of what's going on with the markets and, you know, global issues and things like that. But, you know, at the end of the day, you can only worry about things that you can control. And since we can't control what's happening with interest rates, what's happening with the uh, lecture cycle, what's happening with, you know, geopolitical issues, you really just have to um, um, get your strategy. And that's why I think it's really important to work with a financial professional because our job as advisors is just to keep you pushing the bumpers. So once you have your plan, yeah, it's a good idea to meet with your advisor at least once or twice a year just to, as a checkup, just to see everything that's in place, make any adjustments. But once you've done that, you know, the whole idea is to have peace of mind to know that whatever happens in the economy, whatever happens with interest rates, with, with uh, market cycles, that you've got a plan that's based on your personal investment objectives. Yeah, you go from there. Yeah. So, are there any uh, podcasts that you do listen to to keep up on that? that you have uh, there's several. Uh, yeah, I, there's not one. Uh, or I, books I, or plans. Yeah, but I'm a big fan of, uh, of Linkus. Linkus is a, is a great um, tool that I came across a few years ago that uh, I subscribe to. It's it's basically audiobooks, but in uh, but summarized, like in, you know, usually ten to twenty minute summaries. So you can you can listen to a book. I do it. You know, I started this during the pandemic, actually, when I you know, was doing a lot of walking and uh, I figured it'd be good to multitask. So I would take mm -hmm. my headphones and put on uh, these audiobooks. And, you know, just like with Spotify, you're recommended different titles based on your listening preferences. And so um, so usually if once I, I, I might select an a audiobook that's suggested for that day, and since it's only typically 10, 15, maybe 20 minutes, I'll just let it roll to the next suggested title based on, you know, my preferences. And a lot of times that book I would have never chosen on my own, but it ends up being uh, a great uh, listen and, and, you know, adds to my, uh, I got, I get a lot of value out of it. So I think that's one of the things I really enjoy doing. What was it called? Uh, it's called Blinkist. It's a, it's actually an app. Um, and these are, um, 
you know, basically condensed book summaries for a lot of books that you're familiar with, some that you haven't heard of. Uh, but, you know, as some of this always been strived to, to be a reader, it's just hard to keep up with so many titles. And so book summaries, I think, are a great way to kind of keep abreast of what's out there. But new titles, and of course, some of the classics, classic reads, it's always good to go back and listen to them again, uh, especially if you're in a teaching or mentoring role, because you can reference uh, something that you read in a book years ago, you know, after listening to a summary. And so, uh, yeah, great. It's a great, uh, I highly recommend that. I love that. I really, really enjoy reading, but I hate like actually reading. So the books are more of my thing. Um, I yeah. always get like ADHD whenever I read. So that sounds like a perfect alternative. It's hard. Yes. Well, I've got like usually three or four titles I'm reading at the same time. And so it's just, uh, yeah, it's definitely something you got to stay on top of it for sure. Love that. How important would you say is diversification in an investment portfolio? I think it's really important. And that's, again, my big believer in mutual funds uh, because they offer automatic you know, uh, diversification. Average mutual fund has about 100 to 150 stocks in it. So it's really hard to really lose you know, money in a mutual fund um, unless it's just not the, the company itself. The, the mutual fund is not managed properly, so it's good to go with a, a known name. That uh, especially that works with advisors, and and so that's the that's the easiest way to to obtain diversification. But you know, I, I'm diversified outside of my uh, mutual funds, and I think it's good to be exposed to different asset classes because it's sometimes it's a hedge, as you mentioned before. And there's each asset class has pros and cons, right? I mean, with bonds, for example, it's interest rate risk. With real estate, it's it's liquidity. We're talking about crypto, this you know extreme extreme volatility, and and so every asset class has its pros and cons. But I think it's good to be diversified because you know obviously when markets are, you know when a certain asset class is performing well, another asset class might not be, and they usually people are always chasing the the best returns. And by the time you hear about an asset class that's performing well, usually it's about to go the other way. And so if you're always chasing returns, you're usually going to end up kind of hole in the bag, unfortunately. So that's why it's great to be diversified and uh, not ch trying to chase returns. Okay. No trying to chase returns. <laughs> yeah. They call it in well and gambling. It's called chasing losses, right? So that's <laughs> the reason why gambling is not a good idea. I don't recommend that as an investment strategy, but it's fun and it's entertaining. And I think a lot of people will take that same approach to sports betting or going to, you know, the casino and, and applying that to the investment world. And that's not, um, the best way to go about it for sure. Yeah, probably not. <laughs> what role does risk tolerance play in investment decisions? Can investors like assess their own risk tolerance accurately or would they need to talk to someone? I think uh, they can. I mean, there's certainly plenty of uh, ways to assess your own risk, risk tolerance. I'm sure there's questionnaires you can take online, um, articles you can read about it. But I think the best way is to work with a professional just because that's our job is to really have a conversation, ask questions, uh, determine goals. And in that process, we can usually get a sense for someone's risk tolerance. And that's a really important aspect of investing. And uh, because, yeah, of course, everybody wants to get a great return. But as you know, there's, there, there's, you know, risk return variance and, and it's, it's always a function of, you know, the more risk, the more, uh, the more return, the more risk, right? So it's good to um, assess your own risk tolerance. And in line with that, a lot of that has to do with your time horizon. Because if you're young, you have a lot, a lot of time to be more aggressive. And so your risk tolerance, you know, based on that should be higher. But there are exceptions to that. There are young people that, for whatever reason, I think, you know, some of the older millennials, experienced a lot their first, you know, um, you may have heard of the last decade, right? The first 10 years of this uh, century were really rough. So imagine, you know, being your age, Maddie, and, and graduating, and then having um, the dot-com bubble burst, and then having 9-11, uh, then having uh, a housing uh, bubble and, that ended up bursting that ultimately caused a financial crisis. All that happened in the space of 10 years. Well, if that was your introduction to investing and to, the, you know, to the workforce, well, yes, your risk tolerance might be quite a bit different than someone like my daughter, who's, you know, um, Gen Z, very much more open to uh, taking risks and um, much more entrepreneurial, much more, you know, willing to, uh, you know, excited about investing. That's really, really interesting. And I see a lot of millennials and it was like they were put in such a hard position when they did graduate. Yeah. I could never imagine that. 
Like I went through COVID in high school. I was a sophomore. And even that had a lot of effects. Like there's a lot of opportunities now, but it's just a different type of opportunity that we're going into the workforce with. So it's pretty interesting, like going into these jobs. Majority of them are still remote, which is kind of funny, but it's very hard to find careers is what it seems like for a lot of young individuals. Yeah, it's, it's an interesting time right now. And I think, yeah, remote work is definitely not going away. Uh, companies are trying to wrestle with what works best for them, right? In terms of having people, you know, moderate people in person versus giving them the freedom and flexibility to work remotely. And so, uh, but I think we're in a hybrid role now. And so I think it's just a matter of navigating that and then deciding for yourself what works best for you because uh, companies are always going to have the leverage at the end of the day uh, because of the ones writing the checks, you know. Um, but I think as, as, uh, whether you're again, like myself, an entrepreneur or someone that's looking to start your career in corporate America, let's say, uh, you have a lot more levers than you realize as long as you want to embrace it. Mm -hmm. Most definitely. What's some mistakes that investors commonly make? And do you have any tactics on how to avoid those? Yeah, well, the number one tactic, Granny, is to uh, work with a financial professional because, again, our job is keep people from the bumpers, and um, it's very difficult to separate the emotion from making sound investment decisions. And so one of the biggest mistakes people make is trying to time the market or uh, getting out of the market uh, when it's, you know, when the market is down. That's the, you know, the worst decision you can make, and it's very much an emotional decision either to stop putting money in or pull money out when the market's down. I unfortunately had it happen with clients um, against my advice. And, uh, and that's why it's really important to just, you know, listen to your advisor and uh, our mm-hmm. job is to kind of talk people off the ledge, you know, when, when things are getting, are really crazy, which we've seen, you know, I've seen it numerous times in my career, but we've seen it recently with, with COVID and some of the things that happened. And um, those things are going to happen. We just, you just want to have, make sure you have your plan set and that when you're, tempted to, you know, uh, make a rash decision, that's when it's good to call your, call your advisor. Well, people definitely, um, again, people chase returns, people try and time the market and people definitely, um, bring emotion into making investment decisions. And that doesn't always work well, rarely does. Yeah, most definitely. How does one go about creating a personalized investment strategy that aligns with their objectives and risk tolerance? Yeah, I think it really starts with, again, having that plan. Um, we, um, I condensed our, we, we basically, it's essentially a question here. We call it financial needs analysis. And that condenses it down to five questions because um, it really can be done as little 15 to 20 minutes. Obviously, I'd like to have a little bit more time to put together mm-hmm. a comprehensive game plan for somebody, but it really does start with some basic questions about, um, what people are trying to achieve, you know, long-term goals, short-term goals, medium-term goals, and then um, putting some numbers to that, of course, factoring in um, inflation, because that's definitely one of the biggest things that takes a bite out of our uh, investment returns is uh, the cost of living, which as we've seen uh, the last few years, it's definitely taken a toll. Yeah. Cost of living has definitely increased tremendously the past few years. Yeah, it's it's daunting. It's insane. (laughs) It's really, really crazy. And like my grandma's in California and she can't even afford her house that she's had since like the thirties. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. And seeing more and more of that, it's, it's a bullshit. It's really, really difficult. And it's like a paid off house, but then like the cost of inflation has caused property taxes to increase. And of course she has a house in Los Angeles. So it's crazy. You can get a house in Southern California or let's say the Bay area and still not be able to afford it based on the property taxes and, you know, um, different, you know, insurance and things like that. I mean, it's my mom, same thing. She owns her house free and clear up in the foothills, but because it's, you know, fire, uh, the fire is much higher. Uh, she's paying two types of insurance plus property taxes. And you talk on maintenance for paying. I mean, it's just, it can be really, um, for someone on a fixed income, it can be uh, difficult. And that's why a lot of people are moving elsewhere. <laughs> yeah, it definitely can be very difficult. What impact can geopolitical events and ec- economic trends have on investment portfolios? And should investors respond to these factors? Like, 
Do you have any things that you do specifically? Yeah, that's a good question. I, I, um, I think it goes back to what I was saying about you. We can only really worry about what we can control. And, and there's, there's none of those things that we really have control over. Uh, should we be pay attention to what's happening um, globally? I and mean, we're in a global economy. There's no question about it. And yes, those things will impact um, uh, domestic markets and investment portfolios. Uh, but that's really why you want to be diversified. You want to be invested in things that are not going to have, you know, suffer huge swings because of geopolitical factors. And um, so, yeah, I think it just comes down to, you know, worry about what you can control, which you most the returns that people are going to get in their, in their especially like in their retirement portfolios, for example, are much more, are going to be much more affected by what you do as far as what, what you contribute, how much you contribute, than the returns, you know, as long as you're beating inflation, if you're putting money in, you're all, that's going to always going to be the biggest, you know, uh, piece of your investment portfolio down the road. Super important to keep that in mind. Yeah. So how would you like say individuals should stay informed on these matters and make decisions without being overwhelmed? Yeah. I think it's important to, well, it's good to stay kind of plugged into what's happening in the markets, you know, the media is not a great um, place to get information when it comes to some of those things because obviously negativity sells, right? So mm -hmm. if you're listening to even some of the you know financial um, broadcasts or their news channels. It's um, yeah, you could be all over the place, or you know, if you're if you're starting your day with that, you know, digesting that information, uh, you're going to it's going to just introduce a lot of word anxiety un unnecessarily. Uh, so I really think it's important to um, keep abreast of what's going on, but really rely, lean on your on your advisor, on, uh, on a financial professional to, my, my goal as an advisor is to, and really as a coach and a mentor, is to filter a lot of the noise and just simplify, again, what's become a very complex uh, industry. And that's a, that's a full-time job. <laughs> and so, uh, yeah, so I think as a client, if, you know, I always tell clients, you know, whether, you know, I just met with a nurse uh, on Friday who's done really, really well for herself. Um, and, you know, I always let them know, hey, you know, you've done a great job. You're on track. You know, once we kind of you know, look at their plans and you know, once we assess the fact that, hey, you're on track, just keep doing what you're doing or we'll make this maybe a couple of adjustments. But it's always about, hey, you're good at what you do. She's a great nurse. She's done well. Um, and so, you know, when it comes to investing and, you know, making adjustments, you know, that's what my job is. It's, it's, it's not her job to do that. She can, if she wants to get more, some clients are much more interested and want to know more about the, the markets, what's going on. They ask me questions and I'm happy to answer them. It's like I'm doing now, but it really comes down to, um, Hey, focus on what you're good at and I'll do the same. And I think that that's a partnership that really, really what, what, makes a successful partnership when it comes to investment uh, advisor client relationship mm -hmm. yeah so when would you recommend someone to get an advisor i don't think it's ever too early uh, i think um because in my in my business uh, or my company that i've been with for over 25 years we're geared towards you know uh, middle income clients you know individuals families and so the real challenge i think for people that are lower to middle income is that they don't feel they can afford an advisor uh they don't want to be put on the clock right they don't want to be paying you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars to you know uh, get an, uh, an analysis or an assessment and so uh, because we don't charge a fee you know it's really there's no reason why someone even a lot of the students i'm working with shouldn't be putting together a plan for themselves even if they're not you know ready to fully fund that plan mm -hmm. until they're what's out there in the workforce it's never too early to, you know, to work with an advisor if that advisor is willing to work with you. That's really the question. So you really want to find a company that is not going to um, talk over your head. It's not going to, going to uh, have these uh, really unreasonable uh, requirements for you to start an investment portfolio. Like you know, a lot of full, you know, full service brokers, uh, you've got to have a hundred thousand to $250,000 to get any kind of real service. And so uh, there's a real need for companies like mine that are geared to work with people that, you know, I mean, I start with 50 bucks a month. That's what I, that's all I could put together when I first started investing. And I'm still glad today that uh, I can work with someone that's starting with, 
you know, as little as twenty five or fifty dollars a month, knowing that hey, the goal is to you know increase that as you're as you're able to. Yeah, would you say there's any like? I don't want you to like throw a company under the bus, but are there any mm-hmm. like telltale signs of a bad wealth management company or like red flags? Essentially, yeah, um, yeah. I think there's it's such a large and uh, lucrative industry, um, and so I definitely educate people about some of the red flags to look out for. And I just think there's a lot of uh, companies out there that are uh, big, you know, um, are, are really great at marketing. They're really great at making their um companies sound very uh trustworthy and reliable and if you think about it i mean you know if you look go around to any large metropolitan city you know some of the biggest buildings uh that you know many of the stadiums arenas are sponsored by financial companies primarily banks and insurance companies one of the things that i've seen over the years is that a lot of those uh, institutions are marketing products that are not in the best interest of the average you know working families out there and, you know, we had a full-scale financial crisis 15 years ago that you probably don't remember, Maddie, but your parents definitely do, right? And so we've, um, I think as, as advisors and as, you know, companies in the industry, we're always trying to overcome this sense that people don't fully trust individuals in our industry or companies. And that's that for a good reason, you know, you know companies aren't always doing what's right by their, um, by their clients. And, um, so, yeah, I mean, I, you know, yeah, I, yeah. I never, you know, will mention you know individual companies or you know, because it's not really about that. It's really about you know understanding how these vehicles, these financial products, how they work. What are the features? What are the benefits? And really, what's how does it benefit them? And how does it benefit the clients? And that always should be, um, you know, we have a saying in our in our business that we want to do what's right by our clients one hundred percent of the time. And if every company had that approach, then we wouldn't have. You know, class action lawsuits. We wouldn't have, you know, uh, these bubbles that happen. Um, but of course, because it's all based around money, uh, people get people get individuals, and companies definitely uh, are going to act based on what's going to put the most, what's going to line their pockets. Unfortunately, and that's not the case in every with every company, every every advisor, of course. But it's something definitely to to be aware of, and you definitely want to educate people about that. Mm-hmm. That's very interesting. Yeah, it's. I think. It's super risky when you're getting into just giving someone trust over any financials in your own life, especially nowadays when it's so hard to just make a livable wage and make money. Um, And I think it was Morgan Housel. He wrote Psychology of Money and he was in a podcast and he said, like, why would you take financial advice from someone that doesn't have any certification? Like, treat it like it's your medical health. go to a professional with it because it's essentially the same thing. Like it's such a big aspect of your life, your financial situation situation, because it links to your housing and links to your physical health eventually. And what he said is like, you go to a doctor, like you wouldn't take medical advice from someone that's not a doctor or a nurse. So why would you do the same with your money? (laughs) That's a great, great, that's a great book, by the way. It's on my desk right now. One of our, one of the books on our book list. And yeah, it really makes sense to be educated. Our goal, my goal, at least as an advisor, is to empower clients so that they can take control of their financial situation. Because as I mentioned, I may meet with them once or twice a year. Well, they're making lots of decisions throughout the year that affects their um, their finances and their, certainly their um, their investment portfolio. And so, I want to make sure that they, if they get bad advice, questionable advice, that certainly they can come to me. But they should be educated enough to be able to, you know, determine if that's something that's in line with what they should be doing or if it's something that's going to be uh, in the best use of that individual company and not when it comes to their their financial position. Yeah. So for the last question, I just asked, how do you define success? There's no right or wrong answer. Everyone has different answers, but it's just something that I love to ask. Yeah, that's a great question. It's something we should probably think about more often, uh, especially in this day and age. Um, and I, I, I love, years ago, I listened to uh, a program by Earl Nightingale. Um, and he said that the, the, he, he really came up with the best definition I've heard since then. And that is that success is the gradualization of a worthwhile goal. and 
So it really is about the journey. Um, yes, you should have uh, a, you know, we should all set goals. We should have a plan. We should work that plan. Uh, but as you know, life happens. You know, we all are throwing court balls. We're all going to have to overcome the challenges and adversity, some of which we, most of which we bring upon ourselves, some of which are outside of our control or, or based on circumstances. Uh, but I think if you always understand or, you know, embrace this idea that as long as you're pursuing a worthwhile goal, worthwhile goal um, you are successful. And we should, mm -hmm. it, it's okay to be um, frustrated if you don't feel like you've reached your goal in a timely manner or if you're, you're behind your peers. We've all had those feelings of inadequacy. But I think if you just understand that if you appreciate what you have and that you're working to, um, to, to get ahead in your life and in your career and swing with your finances, then you're a success. And that's, right. that's the beauty of, um, you know, I think it, uh, this career, and again, we're all playing this game that I call the money game. And if you, don't, if you don't know the rules, it's really hard to win. So it doesn't matter whether you're pursuing a business degree or in finance or economics or, or, you know, any other chosen career, we're all going to have to uh, contend with this, uh, this game called the money game. And so it's important to, uh, have a plan and to know that you're as long as you're working, working that plan and working towards a goal, then you're a success in my book. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The money game. It's a hard game, especially, especially if you don't know what you're doing. Yeah, it really is. It's uh, so important that people understand it. And so uh, I, I, I love working with people who are interested and curious about it because yeah, I mean, not only does it allow you to be successful when it comes to your own finances, but I always tell, especially, you know, young people that I'm working with that, hey, you know what, I'm happy to show you the, you know, my experience, wisdom, the rules of money that I've learned. Um, I would just ask that you don't keep it to yourself. I right? mm -hmm. want to share it, especially with people you care about, uh, your community, because we can make a tremendous impact if we're more educated and, um, and willing to act and, and share the information. Yeah, definitely. And being young, there's so many people that aren't well educated on it. And I think like, there's this huge idea of like, capitalism that's been blown out of proportion with people in my generation specifically, where they're almost like not wanting to talk to financial advisors or anyone that's in a financial standing position, mm -hmm. because they believe it plays into capitalism, which I I don't know enough to like really speak on that. But um, for me, I always try to talk to people in those financial positions because <laughs> like, who else are you going to learn from? <laughs> like, Yeah, well, I, I get it. I, I think that, you know, the, the tenets of capitalism is that we all should be working in our best interest, what's, what's mm -hmm. in our best interest. And if everybody's doing that, uh, that creates some, you know, built in checks and balances that, as a society, we should be able to progress and, and all be able to prosper. At the same time, there are going to be always individuals, in some cases, companies that are not doing what's in the best interest. Um, of, well, you know, do, they're doing what the best interest for themselves. But when you take that to the extreme, it, it can impact others in a negative way. And that's, that's the game that we're all trying to navigate. And um, yeah, I can see how people might get a sour taste or... Um, just, you know, bail on that whole situation and say, you know, I'm not going to trust anybody, but, you know, that's not necessarily uh, the definition of success either. Yeah. Do you have any, in, or do you have any last words that you wanted to share? Um, you know what? Uh, yeah, I think you've asked some great questions. Uh, I, I just feel that it's important for people to be knowledgeable, educated when it comes to money, when it comes to business. And, um, I just think it's important to put your best foot forward and uh, and be willing to pay it forward because we can all we all have the opportunity to do that. And as as you've already experienced, I'm sure right, that time goes quickly, right? And so um, it, I mean, my daughter's going to graduate here in May, and it seems like she just got to San Diego, yeah. right? So uh, it's exciting to work with people that are starting their careers, and I just um, I, I, I feel it's really important that we. Um, that we align ourselves with people, with organizations that have, that share our values. And mm -hmm. it's important to find those, those individuals, those organizations, companies, employers uh, that will, that will fit your, uh, that will align with your values because that's really what is going to cause you to be, to feel um, fulfilled and ultimately successful in what you're doing. Because if you're trying to, like me, I spent seven years in corporate America, and for me, and I'm not speaking for anybody else, 
I was a square peg in a round hole. And so for me, choosing an entrepreneurial path, you know, choosing to, you know, run my business still in my own, you know, financial services advisory firm, it's been, it's been awesome. I think it's kept me young, it's kept me energetic and everybody has their own path. But I think the sooner you can find that path and, and just lean into it, the more um, fulfilled you'll be and the more impact you can have in your career. So that's like we can kind of put a bow on it there. Yeah, I agree with you on that. Entrepreneurship is really fun. So it is. It's tough. It's hard. It's not. It's, for, it's not for everybody. But it's, it's exciting. Something, yeah, you. Yeah, it's exciting. It's definitely something that will allow you to kind of come into your own as far as recognizing your strengths, being able to lean with your strengths, and having the, the you know that's the reason why we are I believe in the greatest country ever is that we have the opportunity to to choose that path, and it's not based on how you were raised, not based uh, or you know what you were raised with as far as you know financial wealth or class or race or anything like that. It's really based on your uh, willingness to embrace your strengths, lead with your strengths, and um, be willing to, uh, to to inspire and motivate others. Thank you so much for coming today. I really appreciate your time. You're welcome, man. It's been a pleasure. Thank you.